Well, hello everybody, and welcome to our Open Circle program on America's first great composer, really the father of American music, Stephen Foster. Someone who, like so many great artists, was not really appreciated in his lifetime, unfortunately, but has certainly been immortalized. So let's just start off the program with one of his well-known songs, Old Kentucky Home, to sort of get us into the spirit here. There's going to be a, quite a bit of uh, singing in this program done both by me and hopefully by you at home. So I think one of the great things about a Stephen Foster program is you'll recognize all the music. Uh, again, like I said, his music is really... Uh, been immortalized. It's never really uh, aged. I think it'll be around for centuries to come. People will still be singing his songs. So let's sing this one together. Well, the sun shines bright in my old Kentucky home. To summer, the people are gay. Corn tops ripe and the meadows in the blue. Well, the birds make music all the day. Young folks roll on the little cabin floor, all merry, all happy and bright. By and by, hard times come a knocking at the door, then my old Kentucky home could not. Weep no more, my lady. Oh, weep no more today. He will sing one song for the old Kentucky home, for my old Kentucky home far away. Let's sing the chorus together again. Weep no more, my lady. Oh, we no more today. We'll sing one song for my old Kentucky home, for my old Kentucky home far away. For my old Kentucky home far away. Oh, what a beautiful song, huh? You know, so many of Stephen Foster's songs are just full of beautiful imagery. You know, you can, you can really uh, envision the locales, the places, the antebellum South that he writes about. And there's also a lot of melancholy sort of a melancholy mood in his music. And we'll, in, we'll look into that a little bit. Uh, it was coming, you know, like most artists, these emotions were coming from a genuine source, an authentic source. And he had a lot of sorrow in his life. Well, this is not a photograph of Stephen Foster. Uh, as far as I know, there are no photographs of Stephen Foster as a baby. After all, he was born in 1826. And interestingly, he was born on the 4th of July. So how truly fitting that America's first great composer was born on America's birthday. And uh, it was the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the year he was born. His, he was one of nine children, nine children. His father was William and his mother, great old fashioned name, Eliza. And they were a fairly well-to-do family and had a comfortable childhood. He lived in a small town of Lawrenceville, which is now part of a big city, Pittsburgh. But in 1826, uh, they lived on a home that over, was overlooking the Allegheny River. And there it is. Um, this is the view young Stephen Foster would have had just walking some yards from his home. This is what he would have been able to see. 
So really an, almost an idyllic environment uh, to grow up in if you're an artist. There's, there's so much to inspire your mind and your heart. Truly uh, a beautiful land. And because he lived just outside of Pittsburgh, and of course they had the large riverway there, there was a lot of river traffic. And there were a lot of people working down at the docks and working on these barges and on these boats, etc. It's all this commerce. And many of them happened to be um, African Americans. Many of them were freed slaves. Um, some of them had been born in the North and had never known slavery, but either way, life was hard for them. And Foster would go down to the water and he would listen to the day laborers. And again, many of them African-American and he would listen to the stories and he would listen to the songs. And these experiences helped to shape him artistically. And interestingly, as Foster would age and mature, there would be a lot of songs written in the North about the South, particularly about uh, uh, African Americans in the South or slaves in the South. And the songs were often um, portrayed African Americans in a very negative way. Uh, these were not accurate depictions. There was no empathy in this music. It was really kind of to laugh at to make fun of the Southern culture or African-American culture. And Foster did not fall into that. And a great reason for that was because he had had these interactions and this exposure to people of many different nationalities and backgrounds, including African-Americans. He had a real empathy uh, for these individuals. And that would come out in his music. So here is a nice illustration of a young Stephen Foster. Well, you know, there was no music industry in early America, not even in the 1830s or the 1840s, not really. Um, so that being said, you couldn't really make a living as a musical composer. I mean, um, there were some great European composers to be sure, but here in America, that just wasn't a way to uh, make a living or to raise a family. So he was decent at math. A lot of times people that are good at music, uh, understanding musical structure, are decent at math. There's a lot of overlap there. And so he took a job in his brother's of business uh, as an accountant, balancing the books. And in Foster's own words, the work was mind-numbing. It was difficult. These were long, very dull days and afternoons for Stephen Foster, but he needed to have some money. But while he was working the books, at night in the evening, he would put his work aside and he'd spend some more time at the office working on original music. And again, there was no real music industry in these early days. Um, it was, it was a very daring thing to try to be uh, an American song composer at a time when there wasn't much of an infrastructure for this. You know, um, the publishing houses in New York, et cetera, uh, 1826, 1830s, they didn't really exist. It'd be really until later, the Civil War or afterwards. So, uh, but he had music in his heart and he wanted to create. Uh, interestingly, and this is very important to note here, that uh, during Stephen Foster's time, there were really sort of two kinds of music that were accessible. Uh, one was the sort of uh, classical European sound, um, which didn't appeal to the middle or lower classes of America. And then there was sort of the coarse vulgar music that you might hear in the saloons and along the waterfront and maybe out on the frontier. And, you know, for, again, middle or upper Amer middle Americans, they had no interest in these kind of songs. And so much like Irving Berlin would do um, almost a century later, Stephen Foster um, was in tune to this and thought, I need to write music that may appeal to the average person. And that's what he, would en that's what he endeavored to do. 
So his first composition that went anywhere was Oh Susanna. And I wonder if Stephen Foster had magically been able to look into a crystal ball and see that in the 21st century, that in 2020, in a place that didn't really exist at the time, Minnesota, wasn't even a territory at the time, uh, some kid in Minnesota would be looking into a computer, right, and, and talking about him and about to sing a song that he wrote back in the 1830s. What would Stephen Foster think? How amazing that in the 21st century, two centuries later, we'd still be performing his music and everyone would know the song, Oh, Susanna. Well, it was a hit. And uh, there really wasn't a map to get him on in, in those days, but it gave him uh, the sales from this song, gave him enough confidence to start writing music full time, which again, that was a pretty uh, chancy thing to do to leave a job, a, a good, decent paying job, to try something that there was probably no future in. And he writes, oh, Susanna, it becomes a hit. But he only made $100 total from Oh, Susanna, a song we're still singing today. Why is that? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but he only made $100. Granted, in the 1830s, 1840s, $100 was nothing to sneeze at. It allowed him to quit his job and take a chance at being a composer. I think we ought to sing uh, Oh Susanna. Uh, I Forgive me that the lyrics are not on the screen, but I think all of us are, are familiar enough with this song that we can, we, can, we can come up with the words. So let's sing it together. Boy, how do you get the words in that rock? Well, I come from Alabama with a banter on my feet. Gone to Louisiana, my true love for the sea. Rained all night, the day I left, the weather it was dry. Sun so hot, I froze to death. Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry. I'm from Alabama with a banjo on my feet. I had a dream the other night when everything was still. Thought I saw Susanna was coming down the hill. But we Kate was in her mouth, tears was in her eyes. Said I'm coming from the south, Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I'm from Alabama with the angel on my knee. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I'm from Alabama with the angel on my knee. Yeah, the words didn't make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, song, those kind of novelty songs weren't really meant to uh, have a lot of meaning. They were really just about allowing people to sort of forget their troubles and enjoy themselves. So following the success of Oh, Susanna, Stephen Foster's American folk song, because that's really what I want to talk about is he created a sound that really represented this young country. I mean, uh, there was sort of a mix of the European classical sound. You didn't hear it very much in that song, Oh Susanna, but that was his first. In his later compositions, you will hear as he matures as a writer, you will hear the influences of European classical. Uh, mixed in with Americana, uh, mixed in with American folk, which really created the first American sound. There really wasn't an American sound until Stephen, uh, defined sound, uh, until Stephen Foster came along. So anyways, uh, his folk music that he was writing, American folk, really became in demand. 
So there were many different traveling minstrel groups, just like there had been in Europe for centuries, there were traveling minstrels. Well, in America, we had these sort of traveling choirs, these traveling performers, the predecessors of vaudeville in many ways. And some of the most famous was a group called the Christie Minstrels. And they purchased the rights to Oh Susanna. That's where he made about the hundred dollars. The problem was there was no copyright protection in those days. And once somebody purchased your music, they, they owned it and they could say, I wrote it. And they could get all the credit for it. Um, and as we're gonna see later, some other kind of uh, other things would happen that, was, that were even worse about uh, really taking advantage of Stephen Foster. So he really sold Oh Susanna to the Christie Minstrels and the Minstrels traveled the country, north, south, east, west, performing a song. The Minstrels were international hits. So they actually went to even the courts of kings and queens in Europe and performed Stephen Foster's music. But None of the money went back to Stephen Foster. <laughs> Oops. Um, so another example of his early work um, really focused on an experience in his life when he would go down to the, the, the uh, water, uh, the water, the docks, go down to the town, where people who had been working hard all day were going to spend their money, some of them were gambling, et cetera. Um, and sometimes you'd see these pop-up towns, really like these big swaths of area with tents on them and, and people that would be maybe just coming through town to do some work for a month or so, and then they'd move on, these kind of day laborers. And at night, they'd take the money and they'd go and they'd drink and they'd uh, gamble and they'd party in their own way and uh, Foster witnessed some of this. And one thing he did notice in these sort of shanty towns was there would be these uh, small horse races, you know? So, oh yeah, the Camptown, Pennsylvania horse track, there it goes. So it's right there in the words, I just didn't bother to look up. So that's where, that's where the song Camptown Races come from. He was thinking about these men who would work all day, work hard out in the hot sun, then go spend their money on booze and carousing and gambling, uh, sometimes at this Camptown track. And so the song is called Camptown Races. And let's uh, sing it. Camptown ladies sing this song, do da, do da. Camptown race tracks two miles long on to the day. Gonna run all night, gonna run all day. I'll bet my money on a bobtail name. Somebody bet on the day. Went down south with my hat in the doo da, doo da. Came back north with a pocket full of tin on the doo da day. Gonna run all night, gonna run all day. Bet my money on a box till day. Somebody bet on the day. So, the song we all know, we've all learned as children, is really about gambling. And, uh, you know, here you go. But it's a catchy tune. I think uh, Foster really had a, nick, a knack. Maybe a nick too, maybe a nick knack, uh, for coming up with these melodies that would just kind of stick in your head. Do, 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 do. You could whistle or hum that all day. So once again, Camptown races like Old Black Joe, like uh, Oh Susanna, these were some of his early songs. They were, again, kind of novelty songs, loosely based on things maybe he saw or experienced, but there was no complexity to the music. And you could argue they were a little bit more crass. Uh, as he got a little older, um, he does meet somebody he falls in love with. We'll talk a little bit about her. Uh, and on their honeymoon, they go take a uh, cruise down the Mississippi. Now, he was from the north. He had not spent any time in the antebellum south, although he would go on to compose many songs about the antebellum south. 
But during this beautiful, lazy cruise down the Mississippi, he did get to see some of the antebellum South, and he was really taken by it. Uh, he really had a um, genuine love, uh, not for slavery. He was actually very anti, anti-slavery. But there was a, a romanticism about the South, about the, the uh, beauty of the waterways and the old mansions and the beauty of the land and some of the music and the poetry. And um, it, it impacted him. And a lot of his songs at this point would become more complex, be about the South. And you'd hear a little bit more of that kind of European um, influence in his music moving into this period of his life. So a good example of this would be Old Folks at Home. And um, he writes a song about, you know, longing for home. This person who we're singing about has been gone for a long time, may never see home again, wonders if people are okay, hopes, wonders if he'll ever be back again. And again, the Christy minstrels uh, end up you taking this music and making it an international hit. Um, but the problem was, if you look at the uh, flyer here, right, you'll notice that written and composed by E.P. Christie. Wait a second. It was written and composed by Stephen Foster, right? Ah, no copyright law. So he gave the Christy Minstrels rights to perform his music. He did not give him the right to say he did get, to take credit away from Stephen Foster completely and say that someone else wrote it. But Foster wasn't making a lot of money off of his music. He was falling in love with somebody. He wanted to have a life. He wanted to have a home. He wanted to support them. And so he was selling these hit songs really for very little money. And then people like E.P. Christie and others were going off and performing his music, taking credit for the music now, which is really the problem here. And he was getting no royalties. That lack of royalties would be Stephen Foster's undoing. Interestingly, Old Folks at Home is the official state song of Florida. I didn't know that. Well, this is a beautiful song. And I think, again, you can hear the melancholy in it. I, I just think Stephen Foster's life was really full of challenge and uncertainty and people manu manipulating him and taking advantage of him. His love life, as we're going to find out, was a challenge. Um, and also, I think some of the melancholy is just an expression of um, love for the beauty of this, the antebellum South. But either way, let's sing it. Way down upon the Swanee River, far, far away, there's where my heart is turning ever, there's where the old folks stay. All up and down the whole creation, sadly. I go, still longing for my childhood station and for the old folks at home. All the world is sad and dreary, everywhere I roam. Oh, dear ones, now my heart grows weary, far from the old folks at home. All the world is sad and dreary, everywhere I Oh, how my heart was sad and weary, far from the old folks at home. So you can see that um, his travels on, on the Missis along the Mississippi, his appreciation of the South, his maturity as an adult and as a, an artist is really coming out in songs like Old Folks at Home. You know, Camp Town Race is here to come, do-da-do-da. Do 
very simplistic, silly words, and there's not a lot of depth to the to the the story or the melody. But this melody is much uh, more complex, um, just a lovelier tune all around. And I think you would agree more poetic than I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. And so you can see that he is definitely maturing as a writer. Well, I've talked a little bit or hinted at his love life. Uh, he is really a struggling um, music composer. Again, there just really wasn't the infrastructure in this country at the time, I think, um, to ad adequately re re recompense a songwriter. Uh, instead, people were taking his music, performing his music all over the world, all over the world, even, and he really wasn't getting much credit, and certainly very little in, in terms of royalties. And uh, but he was eking out a living, and he meets this lovely woman, Jane McDowell, who is the daughter of a prominent physician. So Jane comes from money. Jane's used to a comfortable life, but she falls head over heels for Stephen and they marry. And over time, they have a child, one child, Marion. Well, again, maybe things were happy at first, but eventually, you know, the rose fades a little bit. Uh, and, you know, love can take you so far, then suddenly, if you're constantly living under the pressure of uh, running up debt and, uncertain as to where you're going to live because the home you live in might be too expensive and I, maybe I need to move to this town or this city to try to get uh, more work. It wore on Jane. It wore on her. And she began to fear that the husband she had married would not be able to provide her with the life that she wanted for her and later for her child. Unfortunately, Foster and Jane broke up several times. Jane would threaten to leave. Foster would try, then she would leave. She'd eventually come back because she did love him. But this uncertainty and this, con this constant breakups really uh, wore at Foster's uh, uh, emotional and mental state and must have been a very unhealthy relationship for them both and informed a lot of the music that Foster would write. In fact, one of the songs that Stephen Foster wrote that is quite famous is called I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. Well, Jeannie was his nickname for Jane. He's singing about his wife. And, uh, you know, the words kind of speak for themselves. I Dream of Jeannie. Here's an excerpt. I hear her melodies like joys gone by, sighing round my heart or the fond hopes that die, sighing like the night wind and sobbing like the rain, wailing for the lost one that comes not again. Oh, I long for Jeannie and my heart bows low, never more to find her where the bright waters flow. Oof, I don't know about you, I just, I just started crying. I mean, I just, in the moment here, I just kind of lost it. I mean, he is writing from the heart. You are, he is bearing his soul to the world. He is not writing um, in abstract here. He is losing the love of his life, and he is writing about what he's feeling. And again, this shows a real maturity as an artist. The words are absolutely lovely and, and descriptive and poetic. But man, are they sad. And the song I Dream of Jeannie is absolutely beautiful. So Foster, uh, Jeannie, Jane comes back to him one last time. And now it's the Civil War period, or just pre-Civil War. And um, publishing houses are beginning to pop up in the big cities, not in the rural areas, but in the big cities are up. Uh, what would become Tin Pan Alley was beginning to form. So Foster moves the family um, out to New York. And he 
tries to write music and sell music to these publishing houses. And then of course he would get a, uh, a percentage of the proceeds. Well, um, it didn't work that well for two reasons. One, uh, his formative writing years had really been the 1830s, the 1840s, and early 1850s. But musical styles were beginning to change around the Civil War and just after. And um, this sort of John Philip Sousa sound was starting to uh, permeate. Um, his music was just a little behind the times. And so people were not purchasing his music um, as readily as they had before. The second piece was the music that was out there, like I Dream of Jeannie and others, were still hits, but nobody was paying the guy royalties. I mean, he simply was not getting money from anywhere. There wasn't a good system in place, even in the 1850s and 1860s for royalties, to collect royalties, and there really were no copyright lawyers so the problem was people were absolutely taking advantage of them. You would have somebody in Pennsylvania or Massachusetts or Maryland or South Carolina, wherever it is, saying, yeah, I wrote the song, whatever, and uh, taking all the credit for it, selling sheet music with their name on it. So I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, sheet music would have the name of Joe Blow, and this guy was making the money that really should have been going to Stephen Foster. He wound up in terrible debt, terrible debt. And so what happens? He, he's in debt, uh, he's in New York, um, his prospects aren't looking good. Well, the Civil War era comes and it really just changes everything. The musical styles have changed. It's much more of sort of a John Philip Sousa time. And any new compositions that Foster creates really isn't very marketable. And so because of that, the debt gets worse and he's forced to do something that he never thought he would have to do. He has to sell his entire catalog just to not go bankrupt and maybe not even go to prison because he owed so much money to debtors, to uh, people he had borrowed money from. So this is just horrible. He ends up selling his entire music catalog, everything he's ever written for a measly $1,600. But he owes $1,400 of debt. So when everything is all said and done, he has $200 left to his name and he has sold the rights to all of his music. So again, around the world, people are still using his music here in America, even over in Europe, but he's not getting any royalties. He's not getting any credit and he's impoverished. Uh, his wife, Jane, leaves him for the last time. She just simply could not live like this. Um, no prospects of a better life. They have a child to take care of. He's not able to keep his head above water financially, and she just loses faith in it, faith with, with him and leaves and takes his only daughter with him. Stephen Foster falls into a terrible uh, period of despair and depression, and in 1864, while he is ill, he ends up collapsing, striking his head on a porcelain basin, develops a concussion, and lays there, and because there's no one to look in on him, no friends, no family, uh, he lays there and eventually passes away. And Foster was only 37 years old. So a very, very sad end for our dear heart, Stephen Foster. And in his note, in his pocket, no money, but a scrap of paper with the words, dear friends and gentle hearts. We'll really never know what that note was pertaining to. Was it the beginning of another song? Was it a letter to somebody? We don't know, but those were his last words, so, so to speak. So a, a very sad end for a very talented writer, who I believe if he had simply lived a couple decades later, certainly in the 20th century, would have been very wealthy and very successful and most likely a big hit on vaudeville or maybe later Broadway just was a little too early for a man like Stephen Foster in this country. His last song was published after his passing. 
he never got to see the success of his last song, which was called Beautiful Dreamer. And Beautiful Dreamer was in some ways about his wife, Jane, who had left him now permanently, and really about just a better time. Thinking of days that were happier, days long past, things that could have been. Um, I think the song encapsulates where Stephen Foster was emotionally. And again, he passed away before he could see the success of this song. So to finish the program, we are going to hear opera star Marilyn Horn perform the lovely song, Beautiful Dreamer. And here you really see all of Stephen Foster's talents as a writer really come together. That kind of classical European song with still that kind of American sentiment and that beautiful poetry. And um, the song is kind of heartbreaking, actually, as was his story. But, uh, you know, he has a great legacy, the legacy being that he composed over 285 songs. And sure, in his lifetime, he was not appreciated. But maybe somehow he knows, maybe somehow he is aware that in the 21st century, we are here talking about and celebrating the works of this great and unappreciated composer, America's first great composer. So let's finish this program with Marilyn Horns singing Stephen Foster's Beautiful Dreamer. And I'm just gonna pull that up right now. As soon as I can figure out how to make it work. Thank you. 